Okay, so I'm about to do a finished surface. I am going to do it. The next thing I'm going to do is establish band diameter. Remember I went a little small here? So i got to stay a little bigger and make the band. So I want a sharp tool. I'll go right to the grinder. And like I was saying about these wheels, they're just fabulous. The perfect roundness makes it so that all you have to do is take away the tiniest. This, this steel is not really dull. So the amount of steel you need to remove is minuscule so and these can do that especially this is 600 grit so you start for the right side of the tool you use the right side pivot hole you start a little left to center so you roll over the nose and go way down there like that and that did the whole edge it is that's it that's that's what you have to take away to make it absolutely sharp one swing, maybe two, very just barely touch the wheel. These, these, these are without question the single most wonderful thing that happened for wood turners ever. Other than the lathe, I guess. <laughs> so left side for left and roll over the nose again, very lightly, just barely touching the wheel. Super sharpness exists. That's all it takes. This one, presenting the most questions. It, the thimble pivot. I was going to call it the skew SRG pivot, but that's too long. <laughs> thimble pivot for the skew and SRG. Um, it makes the grinding of a piece of steel Anything with a three-quarter inch tang, I mean, other than the big three-quarter tool, nice, precisely made tool. And it pivots real smooth, high-functioning for a spindle roughing gouge or a skew. The other way of doing it has always been with that long bar that comes with a Wolverine. And then whatever the butt of your handle is, it isn't as smooth as this little ball. So this is just a better way. You just got to have three quarter inch tank. I'm only just a little loose there, so not far off at all. You see my, my, my cut started to go out a little bit. So to, to fix that, all I did is go like this. That's it. The tiny little bend of that knee and all of a sudden the bevel is pointed in the right direction. And now I can roll the tool. When I get into this corner, I roll the tool so the back of the tool, the roundness of the back of the tool, is what I get a little gusset there in the corner. That's a desirable thing because on the other side, inside the hat where your head is, you want it nicely rounded. So you have to do the same thing on the outside. Otherwise, you make it real thin right where it shouldn't be real thin. Not there yet. You got to sneak up on this diameter. It has to be just right. I'm getting a real good cut this time. I'm using the side of the tool. I got to keep it going just like it's going because it's working for me. Another thing you can do here is I use, I don't use shear scrapers. I don't own a shear scraper. I just roll the tool over like this far enough so that the bottom is a ramp out. That's a shear scraper. I can shear scrape that. I can take out little inconsistencies in the surface. I can ripples and lumps and bumps. And I can just take the tiniest amount away and, and finesse a little surface. There it is. Just what we wanted. Perfect. So, now we got to make the crown shape. A little bit more work here in this corner. At the back of the tool, if you have to handle low enough, right in that corner, the bevel's rubbing, it won't cut, it won't catch, it won't, it can't do anything wrong. You can float back and forth there like that without any fear of anything happening. So now crown shape is pretty much by eyeball. I need, I need 
a little bit less diameter up here, what I'm seeing. And I need a very slight swale here. I'm not quite getting what I want, but I'm getting close. I'm going to take another pass to per perfect that line. See, I didn't extend my swale far enough, but now I need a bulge. You see, I'm getting all this shape simply by bending my right, my left knee, my other right knee. Really, ideally, there should be three fingers of swale, three fingers of bulge, equal. So I gotta change my foot position because if, if my 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 cut was going out too fast, that means my bevel was pointed too much in that direction. If I just move my feet like that, it's going to be different. Same motion, same. Apply the tool, and I'm going to go in deeper to get the swale I want, and then I'm going to start coming out by straightening the left knee and bending the right knee. That just swings the whole thing very controlled, precise way. You can't do that with your arms. Now I straighten the right knee to come up, straighten up, and make the bulge and then I bend the left knee to continue that bulge. Well, I got a little bit of a hump right here. I didn't come up with a relief for edge of band that I wanted so I need to pick up a cut back here, get rid of the hump and dive a little deeper here, leave edge of band. Picking up a tiny little cut from nothing and sliding into it without some faceting happening is hard. It's one of the hardest things you can do. So you have to take a deep breath first. And then you lower the handle on your leg, cut with a sharp part of the tool, and come in very lightly and get that cut to start without the tool bouncing on anything. You have to come in almost, you just Float in the bevel above the surface and go in for a cut. Pick up that cut. And now I'm having to bend my left knee more so I can get that relief of edge of band that I'm after. Came in into this. I want the band to be something less than an inch wide. like that. Now I have a little tiny hump here where I fell out of the cut and had to go back in. I can uh, shear scrape that away. I need the, the horn here to get out of my way. Fingers on the back of the tool like that so there's no chance of chattering. Just kind of finesse this old surface, get rid of that little ripple right there. That's all good. Okay, we're good to flip this thing over and hollow it out. I like this whole feature we got going here. Boy, this isn't the smoothest. I said it was nice, but it wasn't as nice as I like. I gotta fix that. That's gonna be hard to sand. Very much improved. Last little end I didn't quite get. So we were successful in making this thing turn around and run absolutely perfect. 
Sometimes there's a 64th or a 32nd note that you can't tolerate. You just can't. Masking tape is two thousandths of an inch thick. You put two thousandths of an inch between the chuck and the face of the spindle where it registers, and it'll move this surface here a 64th. So if there was a 64th of wobble here, bring the tool rest around so you can bring a pencil in very controlled and just hit the high spot. And you get a pencil mark. As lightly as you try to touch, the pencil mark's going to be about that long. Does anybody have a pencil I could borrow? So you find that pencil mark and you put the masking tape right there on the back of the chuck. So now it will wobble a 64th and I'll show you how to do the pencil mark. I'll fold a little extra tape in there so we can really get a look at this deal. See that, that tight, you probably can't see it from back there. It's just, we could not turn the inside, one side will be thin, the other side will be too thick. So if that was the condition and you needed to get rid of it, you bring this tool rest right around the back there, you bring the pencil in to just touch it. There's your pencil. So now we got this pencil mark. It's like I said, that long. And it's exactly oh, the opposite of where the tape is. So obviously if we had this condition without tape, and we put the tape where the pencil mark is, you could fix it, make it run perfect. You can put as many as four layers of tape to fix something. And that'll work. It's a great trick. On the flat grain, there's almost no translucence. The more we get up around the curve, the shape, the more end grain we got involved, the more translucence there will be. I put my head right over the, I can put one eyeball on the brim part and another eyeball on the tool and I can see I'm still three eighths of an inch thick right there. It's a nice encouraging feeling to keep going without having to stop and measure. And the sound changes when it gets thin. It goes, it goes from <laughs> real high pitched, <laughs> like a squirrel sound. Um, okay, we've got a little hump back here to get rid of. And then that's otherwise good, and I'm getting good color through now. Can you see the color? on the screen. So here now I can roll, the, I've been pulling shear scrapes off the grain, now I can roll the tool over and push the cut, shear, uh, shear cut. And I'm looking for that light. I just follow the light. And we got to remember, we want this piece of wood for a mini hat. Really good. 
getting some light. Because, like I said, I have the nerve to do this because I know the further up and around there, I get more anger and I get more light. And so I know that. I don't have to, if it gets suddenly bright, I don't have to say, oh shit, because I know I'm okay. I've been there so many times. Yep. Big fat 16. There's a little hump right there I'm going to shear scrape away. I'm going to put the light up here and look at it. Show me the hump. Okay. Almost eight inches. That's a little more than we need for a mini hat. I'm going to take away a big fat eight, make it seven and three quarters. I'm a good height. I'm going to widen the curve a little. Lean on that right side. I'm still two inches out there. I was going to snap. Get it down where it's about an inch and I can just snap it off. Got to snap now. I just didn't get it small enough before. Come on. That knot keeps going. How did it die in that one area? And lit oh, this is on the other side of the tree from that one. Alright. Mini hat. Dark line there is a little hump. Well, kind of take that away and get the color to blend better. Okay, so now it's easy to see where we need to go in. And here, like at the edge, you got to close the tool completely so the tip doesn't run one way or the other. Once you're in a little bit, roll open, push. So again, same trick, one eyeball on the outside, one eyeball on the steel. It's about a quarter inch thick there, a little more. So I'm going to take a good big 16th and we'll get some serious light now. You can see how light helps expedite the process because you, you don't have to wonder where am I in the world. I'm getting some light now. I'm losing that light, so obviously things are getting thicker. I know I got some light wood there, so I'm safe to go back and say, hey, let's do that again. Yeah, it's 3 sixteenths thick now. So we can take another bite. Close the tool. Take a bite. Open up. Push. And the rubbing bevel is your friend. It does have to work for you. It's uh, a case of you don't really need both hands on the tool. The rubbing bevel is a hand. If you do it right. So now here we got to get this little dark right on this curve because we left it round on the outside. We got to round the inside. 
so the color wraps around. You see the wet spots? Because I've cut inside, it lets the water come out. Until you cut so that air can come in in the middle, the water is trapped there by the virtue. There's just as much water from this center out to center out, and they're both trying to get out, but they can't go anywhere because there's no air. You let some air in, the water comes out. So that's how deep I am. So right here, right now, we are still big 3 sixteenths. So my eyeball thing helps me, but it's not true. You can't totally trust it. So now I know I still got to take a fair bit of wood. So you can see we're going to get a lop writer in here. Now we got the situation where we have some white wood there. There's a big patch of the white wood, but it doesn't go all the way. So we can't take this amount of light with us all the way, because we don't have the white wood all the way. So that would be too thin up high there. So we got to kind of measure our way to the next phase without trusting the light totally. I'm going to use that big one inch tool to get rid of some of this stuff in the middle. So this goes right in, wide open, glued up, cuts against the side drain, it takes out big shaving. It just makes the work go faster. Okay. You can see I'm using the half inch tool a lot now. I use half inch as my baby. Before there were CBN wheels, I would use the three inch tool for the finished cut because I felt like I needed that. It, somehow it just did a better job. But now that the tools get as sharp as they do, this is it the whole way. Now I'm going to take some light with me, but not all of it. And then I'm going to want to just see some light up here, and then I'll stop and measure how thick is that. It's a lot of wet spot. You can see how high I am. <laughs> Very clear, that's how far I've gotten. Simple as that. But helpful to know. Oh, it's still thick. Up there, as far as I've gotten, it's still 5 sixteenths. So there's plenty of wood to cut. We're going to get some more light. So I try to leave this a big 30 second thicker than I want for a final cut. Because what I'm doing in here is a whole series of cuts, one after another trying to link them up and invariably there's some little uh, lumpy lumpy stuff and this cylindrical shape is firm enough by virtue of the shape I don't need thickness for it to be stable for a final cut the whole way so I'm going to work to try to make this about an eighth inch thick all the way and then sharpen the tool and take one final pass on the whole thing I'm a little over an eighth right now. So I'm going to shave that down a 32nd and then continue further up. When I'm looking at the side over here where the tool is at, at the light, I can't see how big is my cut. I have to look over there to see how big is my cut. So my eyes are shifting back and forth all the time at about the same rate I'm moving my head now. So the wet spot out there tells me that I'm an inch and a quarter from being up still, so I can safely take a lot of wood out of the middle here and not be too deep. And if you don't believe the light, how high up you are, you stick, or the wetness, you stick a light inside, and you can see where we are with thickness. I'm a little higher with cutting, but not with thinness here yet. I want to get up to within about one finger width of the top because I need that for that shape that I want to make. So I'm close to that. I'll make it flat there and then I'll go up in that corner out toward the side and get that thinned out. And we're just about the end of our white wood. So our white wood has been bright up until here. But there's no more white wood, so we've got to be careful not not make it too bright there because it'll be too thin. 
I hog the middle out there so now I can put the horn of the tool rest up in there to get closer to my work with the tool rest. Yeah, that, I made the flat spot there at that height. I need to go up another three-eighths, make that all flat, and then go up in that corner. I'm three quarters from being up. I want to be more like five eighths. So I'm going to deepen that just a little more, and then I'll go up into that corner. Now I want to know thickness as high as I am. The real thickness, not the light value thickness. And that's another thing that tells me how high I am. So I've got a lot of ways to know how far up I am. I'm, I'm that eighth inch that I was looking for. That's good. So now we can go carry that light to the top. And in here it seems like, wow, that's a dangerous place to be. How the hell am I going to survive that? Well, the fact is that when you put the flute straight up like I have it and you push in, at some point, because I roll my tool, the bevel wraps back on both sides. The bevel is rubbing on both sides. It won't go any deeper. To get any deeper, I have to take a little from that one side and I can take a little from the other side and I can just widen the whole thing and then I can slowly, very safely, without any possibility of a catch, go up into that corner. And now I have to swing the tool sideways to follow the shape to get some light on the outside. Wet spot is still a little bit too low. I gotta get further up in there. <laughs> and I always wanted to get as tight as I could inside, so I used this narrow, I ground a 3 8 tool to a very narrow tip. Um, and that works, because I don't want a big fat roll up here. This should be cr pretty crisp edge. Then I realized if I leave the inside there, I can make this thin up here thinner than I would if I had it cut all the way to the top. So I'm going to sharpen the tool and take that one pass up through to get rid of all the ripples and lumps and bumps that were left behind by that series of cuts. <sighs> Ideally, you have a, an air hose here to blow all these out because they can trip up that final cut. So. To get rid of those lumps and bumps, I gotta see them. So I bring the light over here and I glance it. So now I can see the ripples over here. I'm gonna put it, can the camera get past the light? I gotta get my head in there. I gotta, yeah, I can do this. I know how much I'm allowed to take away. I don't need the light coming through anymore. I, I, I know I left it at an eighth inch. I know I'm going to make probably a 30 second and another 30 second or shy 30 second of a cut and get the final smooths without fuzzies, sharp tool, surface I can get and, and get rid of all the ripples in the process. I see lots of ripples there. I want to leave the band a little thicker than all the rest. And I'm looking exclusively over here at the size of my cut because that's the important thing. I just lost it. I backed up and grabbed a little more. And I'm seeing a, a, a smooth surface come out the back end of my cut. I'm a happy camper. I pull the tool toward me to follow the shape. Cut's getting a little big now, but not straight, not excessive. Now I gotta push the tool away to follow the shape, follow the shape, follow the shape. Breathe. Smooth and nice. Barely needs sanding. For the inside, how good's it gotta be, right? Uh, as long as the cuts tear out free, and it was because of the sharp tool. See here, at the band, and just above the band, a nice three thirty seconds, less than an eighth, but not the sixteenth that we're putting everywhere else. Up further up, I got a little loose, but then way up, I'm rubbing again. So I got to take more up there. Here I'm good. I'm free, not rubbing right here at all. Snug up. That part is big fat sixteenth. That's what we wanted. 
It's just that the last inch there needs to be thinner. No scraping inside. When the wood's that thin, it doesn't like it. The good news is it's far easier to get a nice bevel rubbing cut because the shape fits the tool so well. You can do good cuts inside way easier than you can on the outside because of the cylinder shape. Looking good now. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. And now the dome. We don't want the dome any higher. I, don't, I hate it when the dome sticks out of the top of the hat, the way my drawing does. That was a mistake. So right now, at the center of the dome, I got strong six inches. And in my height there, I've got just about six inches, but I've got that little bit of extra, that, that thickness. So I'm good. So all I need to do now is smooth that out. Uh, and it's done, height-wise. Just get rid of that torn up grain from the roughing end. Put very little at the very top because that's the height we like. Don't really want to go any higher. I have a little carbide disc tool that I can use in there to rub the bevel um, to get that smoother. But I don't have it with me. There's a limit to how much I can haul. I'm going to try to make it just a little better with the half inch. And i got to get rid of this hard shoulder here. That's got to round over a little bit. Okay, sanding. We be sanding. I got the good sanding stuff. Um, I used 120, 180, 220, 320. Well, I don't do the after sanding I do with the 6 inch extension, the flexible pad, and my drill press. And I can hold the bowl or the hat in my hands. And I go 320 that way, and then I also do 360 Abrolon, the, the bigger box stuff. Abalon is great stuff. It's stupid expensive, but it, it does a job. 360 grit, and they're six inch diameter. That's why the box is bigger. So they stick out here a half inch, give a real fold over edge. It amplifies this effect. So it makes a, a very good inside the hat, all around, totally removes all the scratches. In, mostly I use the six inch extension that way in the drill press. If you don't have a drill press, you can put a chuck and do it this way, on the lay. These backup pads, when you see the stock ones over there, are pretty stiff. They're kind of like this, you know. This is a different brand, but they're very stiff. So I grind the back off to make them flexy. And you know, we're not going to use that 40 grit. <laughs> that was for something else. That's another thing you can do with these backup pads. I do these knobs. Just turn a knob like that, tap the hole. 5 16 24, put some super glue in there, backup pad, and these are great for. It's almost as powerful as a, an electric device. You can really sand some flat work with, with that. Dang. I make a lot of these. I always sand in reverse of the way I cut because it, it gets rid of the fibers that didn't get cut better. I don't have so many of those fibers as I used to. Well, that's good news. But I always make sure it's good and tight so it won't spin loose on me while I'm sanding in reverse. Slow down a little. Fingers behind so you support it a little bit. I used to come over here and stand here like, uh, I don't do that anymore. 
I stand the inside, I get that all good, I turn around, I turn the top, stand the outside from over here. So I'm, I'm done with the script. So now, because I stand in reverse, all the scratches are like this. I go forward on the next grit, those scratches will be the other way. So if I stop and see any of these, I know I'm not done with the next grit yet. So now because this is going down, I gotta put the drill in forward and go up against that. And use your belly as a shock absorber. That's what bellies are for. Takes all the Take a lot of pressure off your wrist. Now over there I can stand from here, still in the same, that's going up, so this part of the disc is going down. I don't have to change the thing. There's a few of those other way scratches. I can just get those out like this. So every one of my hats has a spiral cut. I'm going to do that now before I do the 220 grit. Up in the top, a little circle and a spiral at a very low speed. Circle. Get it? So then we go in reverse again, because then I, for the same reason I can see if I'm done with that grit, if I see any of the scratches going the other way. At 220 you don't have to push as hard to do something, so you know, I don't have to put the hand on the back anymore, I'm just kind of tickling it. A little bit by hand with that. We'll do the 320 on the drill pass back at Ron's place, I guess. <coughs> do not put it down on the finished sanded surface. The iron will react with the wood and make blue marks in no time. You can't sand them out. I use mahogany for these jaws because I happen to have some 10 quarter mahogany and because it's stable, very stable wood. It doesn't move a lot. It doesn't change shape a lot. And the reason for all the steps is that you don't really want to adjust this chuck very much because the more you change it from where it was, it was when you cut it, the more if you had this all the way closed and you cut this round, you open it up, it's a bump and a bump and a bump and a bump. And that would work for turning, but when you start to burnish the band, it gets darker on the bumps. Obviously. So, you can see this is turned at about this setting, so they're pretty round. There's not bumps and bumps. So, small, medium, large hat. This is a my favorite bulb holder. Most of the ones you can buy are plastic and bad, like like this one. It just has a bent metal bracket. This has a cast. It holds. It's just a way better thing. These work, but this is better. And the only place you can get these I know of is Lowe's. We need this guy, Morse taper, in the Morse taper. And that sticks out enough so that the, none of the lamp parts hits the jaw parts of the chuck. On the outboard end, you use one of these, made out of wood, painted fancy colors, so if you drop it in the shaving, you can find the damn thing. It goes right in there. I have this nice brand new set of Vice grips I just bought, I think beautiful. <laughs> Borrowed out of the tool room. There. The light will hang steady now. Plugs. They're, they're, 
These come out just by squeezing the legs together, and you spread the legs open. There are two little points that pierce the insulation. And everybody says, where'd you get that? It's every hardware store from coast to coast. They all got them. Been around forever. No tools required. This is speaker wire, so sometimes these have a hard time making connection. The wire's a little too narrow. And then I brought some LED bulbs this time. Haven't used LED bulb in this situation before. Back when everything was a hot light bulb, the heat was a problem. So I was happy to use the curly fluorescence. But these are even cooler. They make no heat at all to speak of. So you can leave that light on the whole time and be happy. There are no problems. So that's about all the tightening you can do. Just like that's it. It's not bad. It holds pretty good. But we still have the advantage of being able to put the life center in there. And we'll do that. And that's right on center, just the way we wanted it. With all this stuff on there, you can't go 700 RPM. We go a little faster than that. Getting a little bit of light there now. And this is obviously all by the light. There's no more calipers. Can't get them in there, no how, no, how, no way. Makes it a little easier to be more aggressive on the rest of it instead of waiting, looking for it all the while. So I get this out of here. It'll stay on the chuck well enough for the little cuts that I have left to do. So now I can do a bevel rubbing cup and get rid of all those ripples. In the middle I can push the cut this way. But the rest of it I gotta come from over there. Like it is. And if it's pretty thin, it can sometimes chatter. The wood is so flexible it wants to chatter. It makes a harmonic spiral. Get anything like that going, you put your thumb on it like that, then it won't shatter. Right there in the bottom of the valley, it's pure side grain, so you gotta leave that a little bit dark. You don't want that as bright as the rest. Something like that. That's ideal. Normally I stop before that amount of light, and it's too stiff. The whole thing moves like this. It has to flex right under your thumb. Then it's thin enough. It has to dimple in where you're pushing on it. And we're good. So we're sanding. And we can turn the light off now. There's one very crucial thing you got to remember. Because it happens to many of my students. I would tell them, you go into the middle and sand with a power disc. Don't stay there very long at all because that will very quickly get way too thin. And uh, so you got you sand and sand and sand, you go in there, uh, back out again, sand, 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 in there, back out again, in there, back out, and that's it. That's what you gotta do. So this is dry enough for sanding all over. We're good to go. Go back to the 120 grit. And again, since this was turned in this direction, we need to sand this in reverse as well. I'm going to tighten this chuck up just so it doesn't come off. And we can slow down.
Just come in, and just stand all of this. You're just standing in a wide area. Go in there, get the hell out. Go in there, get the hell out. That's it. So here's where the this backup pad really does the job. With a very thin edge, you can get in the corners like that. That you couldn't do with a fat edge backup pad. And in this corner here, you can get right in there. Now here I can flex the pad so it fits the shape pretty well. But you can hear I'm pressing pretty hard to make that happen, but that's okay. You can't press hard out at the edge of the brim, but here you can. So to get out to the edge, you have to reverse the direction of the sander so you go down against what's coming up. And you can also go up here from out here. In that corner, you can get the edge of the sandpaper to go right in there. You always got to remember to do what I call drag the tool. You don't want to point up in and try to stand because at some point the tamp paper will grab and kick and you can break your hat. You got to drag. You're sanding up into something, you got to hold the tool so, so it drags. So there's no possibility for it to kick. You go this way, it'll catch and kick. To get into that corner. So the middle of the paper is still sharp as hell, obviously, so we can just use that a little bit. We're almost done. Okay. Burnish a band. Last thing on the lathe is to burnish the band. I discovered that quite by accident. The first hat I was doing, hat number one, uh, while I'm turning it, I'm going, there's a lot of hat band. Oh, wooden hat. There's got to be wood and hat band. Well, how am I going to do that? I've got to make the hat band with wood somehow. A lot of veneer, but that wouldn't work because it would move. You know, the, wood would, the hat would move and the veneer wouldn't. And, and what, do you, what am I going to do here? So, desperation. At the end, I grabbed the baluster that was cut to a point, made it more pointy, cut to a 45 on a chop saw, and I just burnished it with that, made it black, burned it. Well, that was problematic because it was... The heat was creating a lot of little micro checks. When I started bending the hats, they, uh, those micro checks were turning into cracks. Right here. If I'm gonna keep making these hats, I gotta, re I gotta refine this, this hat. I can't keep using a baluster. It's a little too brutal. What could I do? And I took a piece of ebony, thin stick, and wrapped some blue tape around it so I could, like a little handle. As soon as I touched the wood, it was black. It was like, boom! Didn't take any burning, no smoke, no nothing. <laughs> like, uh, so my immediate thought was, if it's blacker with ebony, is it redder with rosewood? <laughs> got a piece of rosewood, and lo and behold, there was like an, oh, now I got a color palette. I got wenge, and zero coste, and, uh, purple heart. I tried all kinds of wood. And, you know, being ebony work, you would think, African black wood would also work. It does not work at all. It just polishes the wood. No color comes from it. Nothing. Weird. Um, and for years, people told me, oh, you want real good red, you got to get some Rioja. I didn't, I didn't 
get any Rioja. Finally, I get a hold of a piece of Rioja, and I'm all happy. I'm going to go home and try it. Acted like African blackwood. No color, just polish. Stupid. Paduk is a great word for it. Ebony, Paduk, Madagascar rosewood is the one that makes the nice red color. You can't get that anymore because Madagascar is not shipping raw lumber anymore. You want something from their wood, they say, what would you like us to make of it for you? <laughs> Our people need work. Yeah. Honduras did that years ago with the mahogany. Yeah. You want mahogany? You want Honduras mahogany? What, what do you want me to make for it? So Paduk is a great substitute for the Madagascar. It's almost the same color. So I'm going to do black line and a black line with some paduk in between, with a little fade in the middle. And for that, we need as much speed as we dare have on this thing at this point in time. And once an area has been burnished and used, it becomes glazed. It becomes hot, hard. It doesn't work. So you got to sand that got to create new surfaces so there's no burnished area at all and I'm creating a sharp edge here you don't want to stick that sharp edge in the wood because it'll cut and it'll follow a grain and get all over the place you want to use this side and flip it and use this side you put the tool rest far enough away so you can get one finger behind it and then you push with that thumb and you hold the stick like this black right away and if you're smart you save this stuff in a film vial so if you need some black filler you got it a little super glue and you're good the trouble is we, we don't have film vials anymore <laughs> well, I guess you can buy little containers like that this is all sanded already Yeah, I like to fade it in the middle. It just gives a little extra depth. Came off the band a little bit. I just got to clean that up. There it is. All the while, this has been shrinking. It's a lot tighter now. So you got to be careful how hard, how how tight you tighten this, and how long you let it stay on here. Because it's given up some moisture to this wood. Now this is swelling up while this is getting smaller. Bad thing.